Well, let's finish up our Bible study this week, okay? What's in a name, number four. We almost got through last week. Had a couple of things to do, and I didn't want to rush or go too long and too late. So we have just quickly, just a quick rundown. We learned about Adonai, meaning the Lord of all things, which is a very physical, uh, spiritual thing. We saw Elohim in the beginning, the Creator. We saw Yahweh is the name of the Creator, right? We then saw that when Lord God shows up in the capital L-O-R-D, that that is Yahweh Elohim, that is the name and His task or His job. Who He is by name and what He does, the Creator. Then in the New Testament we saw something brand new, and that is the Abba. The, the daddy father, okay? And we had an intimate relationship that we did not have anywhere in the Old Testament. We saw that the very name Yahweh then is made up of three words. He will be, being, he was. If we take those three words and contract them, it becomes Yahweh, which we call I am, right? The great I am, he said, that's my name, Yahweh. Remember, it's right to left. Yah, ha, wa, ka. Yahweh. Look at Hebrews 13, 8. Just to refresh us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Which, if we think about it, is basically what Yahweh is, isn't it? Same thing. That uh, the I am. We looked at the God of the patriarchs. That there was another name that was used for the God of the Patriarchs, and that was Shaddai, the El Shaddai, okay? And uh, we looked at many verses there that looked at that, and just literally, that's only one of about 38 verses where Shaddai is used. It's used all throughout the, the Patriarchs. Um, and so that is their God. And, and what is that? That is the Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. And... It's his way of telling his patriarchs, his people, his family that he's creating, trust me, I can do anything. And he started with Abram and Sarah. Yeah. I can make a baby out of a hundred year old person. I can do that. Trust me and I will be your God if you'll put your trust in me. And so each one of the patriarchs, if we look, had some kind of a trial of faith and that's why they're in the Hebrews 11 chapter of the Hall of Fame of Faith. Um, you know, faith is the evidence of things not seen, is how Hebrews 11 one begins. And so each one of them had to say, you are the God who can do anything. And I'll trust you. And he became their God then. So that's the Shaddai. Shaddai, we said the Lord God Almighty, is shown by the letter Shin, Shin. Now, Shin can be both an S-H and an S. If it has a little dot above it, then it becomes S. We're looking at Shin, the S-H sound, okay, of Shaddai. And we looked at the city of Jerusalem because he said, I will write my name on the city. And so we looked at the Kidron Valley, we looked at the Gehenna Valley, and we looked at the Tyropian Valley. This is the bedrock of Jerusalem. Now, something that's kind of interesting, I've pointed this out in other teachings, but gosh, while we're here, let's do it, okay? This is the Temple Mount right here, okay? This is all Mount Moriah. It's all one rock, right? It's all one, one chunk. But it doesn't stop here. It extends clear out to here. Now, I've made it clear to you that I do not think archaeologically that the garden tomb is where Jesus was crucified. But the garden tomb is right there. If it is where Jesus was crucified, then he was sacrificed on Mount Moriah just like Abraham and Isaac. Think about that. Because you know where the, where the Holy Sepulcher is? The Holy Sepulcher is over here. Totally different mountain. Totally different spot. Even though I don't think the garden tomb is it, 
I have a lot of trouble that Jesus was not crucified on Mount Moriah. Because that would be the fulfillment of the sacrifice on the Temple Mount. And I think that God is not that slipshod, as we've seen. There aren't coincidences. So I believe that we probably have not found the place of the crucifixion. But it's going to be over in that area where the garden tomb is. I'll tell you why we don't think the garden tomb is the place. The tomb that's there that you walk into, see that it's empty, you come back out, you have your picture taken there. That's a, that's a tomb that was built in the 2nd century. But nobody knows what was there 100 years earlier. Could there have been other tombs? Could there have been other caves? Remember, caves are built in quarries. They quarry, they have a cliff, they finish the rock, and they dig in and create tombs. Who knows that they didn't build a first century tomb and then chop away to get more rock and then put a second century tomb in? We just don't know. It's 100% conjecture and guesswork. But I think it's really strange that it happens to be, coincidentally, literal on Mount Moriah, an extension of Mount Moriah. And if you look at the Abraham and Isaac story, it doesn't say, go to a particular mountain. It says, go to the region of Moriah, and there I will show you the mountain. And so we call it Mount Moriah because it was in the region of Moriah. But we don't know that it was there. But it's where David was told that Abraham did it. And that's where the temple was built by Solomon. Makes sense. I mean, I, I don't want to backpedal on, I just want to say I can't prove this. But I think it's really cool that Mount Moriah is long and stretched out. And any place along there could have been his place of crucifixion. Sure. And he would have still been crucified on Moriah. Okay? So we looked at then some of the spots there. Mount Zion, the Temple Mount, the Wailing Wall is turquoise, and the Garden of Gethsemane is across the Kidron, and it makes a letter Shin. It does make Lord God Almighty. And isn't it interesting that it's the God of the patriarchs who fulfilled the promise of the nation that they would be a great and mighty nation. That was the God that they knew was the El Shaddai excuse the El Shaddai God and that that's Jerusalem where he took them Amen. and made his home so again a little more than a coincidence I think then we know that the, tab that the uh, uh, tabernacle rested at Shiloh and God said I will write my name uh, on the place where this sacrifices are made but later then it moved to Jerusalem about 360 years it was in Shiloh which, by the way, the man I've been talking to who's going to, tour, who's going to give me a tour of Shiloh, the head archaeologist at Shiloh, had all of his permits approved to dig this summer. If the war is not waging, they're going to be digging at Shiloh because uh, he, he wrote in a newsletter uh, to all of us that are interested. He said, if the war happens, who knows what will be destroyed and never be found? He said, we must work while the day is light. And so he's telling, he's telling every volunteer from college age to my age, you've got to sign a waiver that says, if we die, it's not my fault. I mean, they got waivers that just, that will take you through a war and say, I know what is possible, but I still want to volunteer and dig. Now, again, we were not going to go back this next year, but I did have the promise that he would show me around in 2025. So um, he's going to be there in 2024 if it's at all safe, if the government will let him at all. He's already had the permits approved. So there are only three sites that are approved for digging in 2024, and he's one of them. So it's pretty cool. But what does that mean? Well, Shiloh is just off the picture, just off the picture to the left. It's just where that valley kind of runs off the, uh, the map there. And Jerusalem is there. And in between the two, etched in the mountain, is the name Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. Geographically west of Jerusalem? North. 
north. Thanks for asking. This is on its side. Jerusalem should be at the bottom, Shiloh at the top, and they've slipped it so it would fit on a widescreen presentation. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's slipped onto its side, but, uh, and Shiloh is just off, and we are standing in the Mediterranean, basically. We're in the Mediterranean looking, and then the Jordan River and the Dead Sea is in front of us, off the screen to the top. So they've taken the map and flipped it sideways. But you, and when you flip it sideways, it spells right. If you flipped it north and south, you wouldn't see it. Yeah. So it's, it's written from um, <clears throat> facing the east and the coming king. Yes. Then you can read his name properly. Again, what a coincidence. Yeah. What a coincidence. Okay, what's in the name number seven? This is where we start out then. This is tonight. We start out with what's in the name, fact number seven? Yahweh. We've seen that. You ought to be seeing that in your sleep, right? Well, remember that the Hebrew alphabet is both numbers, letters, and symbols. It is symbolic. Every letter has a number, one, two, three, four, five. Every one of them has a symbolic interpretation. They are a picture of something. You know, in Chinese, when they write Chinese, they say the duck, the open door, the, they're really pictograms. The Chinese alphabet, so is Hebrew. Hebrew is a pictogram. And so when, he, when rabbis are interpreting, they're not just looking at the letters and the words. They're looking at the numbers and the symbols to see if there is a message within the message, under the message, beside the message. And this is why the Hebrew scholars spend their whole life digging through this stuff. It's not just see Dick, see Dick run, see Jane, see Jane run. There are layers in this interpretation. So, when we look at Yahweh, the symbols are an open hand, an open window, a nail, and a window. Now, you can see that in the form of the letters, can you not? Yes. See an open hand, see a window that's open, you see it's broken up top, it's a window that's broken up top, and then a nail. Very easily seen, you don't have to squint and pretend. It's very, very simple. So Yahweh, an open hand, open windows, and a nail. <clears throat> the number of the two windows is five. Five is the number of grace being revealed. Grace is given. Grace is shared. And here it's shared twice. With a nail and an open hand. Grace poured out on two open hands held by a nail. The very picture of Yahweh is grace revealed through an open hand and a nail. Now you show that to a modern Jew and they go, you wrote that in there because that means Jesus, doesn't it? And you go, yeah, but it's your your Bible that says so. It's like Isaiah 53. If you show, if you just hand a piece of paper and say, this is out of the Bible. This is a scripture out of the Bible. Will you read it for me? And they read about the suffering servant and they go, well, that's, that's New Testament. Did Paul write that? Is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Who wrote that? And you go, uh, one of your prophets wrote that in the Old Testament. This is one of your prophetic books. This is Isaiah, who they really admire and really respect. And when they find out that that's in their Bible, doesn't it sound a lot like Jesus, they ask and say, we thought so. What do you think? When you do the same thing with the symbols of Yahweh and say, an outstretched hand, grace revealed in an open window, being poured out from heaven, and a nail, what picture do you get in your head? And they too, they say, Jesus. 
Yahweh became flesh. Yes, sir. Is that what? Isn't it? Or wasn't it from Isaiah that was being read from when Jesus stood up in the yep. midst and said, "This day has been fulfilled." And fulfilled in your presence. Yep. Presence. That's what he's saying. So, yeah, they have, how can they not? How can they not? So, what's in a name? A lot. Yeah. Everything that we've learned about Yahweh, but it's when you look at the symbolism and the numerology, it brings us back to the same message and to the same passage. It's consistent. The Lamb. Yes. The Lamb. Well, number eight, final. This is it. This is our last lesson. John nineteen fifteen. John nineteen fifteen says, So they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Wow. What a line to cross. Rabbis taking an earthly king. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put on the cross, it is written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. I'm going to bend the knee to you guys. You bend the knee to me. I wrote it. I'm in charge. Live with it. Live with it. If you look in Hebrew, now, let me be first to say, there are two ways that this phrase can be written. Going from the Greek to the Hebrew, there is a minor difference, and it could be one way, or it could be another way. But the most ancient way is what I'm showing you. Okay? Around the 3rd century A.D., some of the Hebrew and Aramaic mixed, and it could be a little different. But I believe this is the way that it was written at the time of Jesus. So, remember right to left. So Jesus, Yeshua, that's the name Yeshua in Hebrew. Yeshua of Nazareth, and the king of the Jews. You see that's written right to left. So read it quickly. Yeshua of Nazareth and the king of the Jews. If you take the first letter of each one of those Hebrew words, Yah, <laughs> have Yod, Yah, Va, Do you understand that if this is right, that every Jew who walked by saw the name Yahweh above his head and wanted it changed? Change it. Change it. You're calling him Yahweh. And Pilate said, what I have written, I've written. Don't you think God was speaking through his mouth at that time and said, hey, what I've written, I've written. Yeshua of Nazareth and the King of the Jews. The only difference that we could get in this is that if it's, if it's said in the Greek or the Hebrew, Jesus the Nazarene. Now, you and I know from Old Testament studies, who was a Nazarene? Who was a Nazarene in the Old Testament? Hmm? Who couldn't cut his hair because he was Nazarene? Samson. Samson, yeah, was a Nazarene. Okay. 
Nazarene was a sect of Judaism. We have no inkling whatsoever that Jesus ever belonged to the sect of the Nazarenes. He drank wine. They don't drink wine. There's nothing about him not cutting his hair. There's absolutely nothing in the scriptures that said he was a part of the Nazarene sect. But we all know where he was from. So, in your Bible, if you read this, it says, look at it. 19, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Who has Jesus of Nazareth? Raise your hand if your Bible says of Nazareth. Okay, a lot of you have of Nazareth. That is what it should say. But a lot of people have taken this English translation of Jesus the Nazarene and said, well, if you write it that way, it doesn't say Yahweh anymore. Well, there's no reason you would call him a Nazarene because he wasn't. It's a bad interpretation. A Nazarene is not somebody from Nazareth. And somebody from Nazareth is not from Nazarene. A Nazarene. It was a sect, a belief system. It was a school of thought. Are you not the one from Nazareth? They didn't say, are you the sect of the Nazarene? Never. So I believe this to be the true godly way and that it does spell out the name Yahweh. Amen. Number nine. John 1, 17. Having fun yet? For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Boy, what an awkward word. I, I didn't realize it was so awkward until I read it, realized. Does that make sense? Well, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. If we were to reword that, we would say, take that word realized, grace and truth became a reality through Jesus Christ. Isn't that what it's saying? It was realized. It became a real thing. It became a real reality. Mark 5.17 says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill or to make a reality. It all became a reality through Christ. So the Yahweh becomes the man from Nazareth. And the name Yahweh was given to him early on and in his last breath. In his last very breath, grace and truth become a reality. Romans 10, 13. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You see the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord hears the simple phrase of an Adonai, an earthly master, a God that we trust in. But we know now that what's in a name is that Adonai is just the beginning of the God that he is. It's just the start of who and what he is. So what's in a name? Everything. Grace and truth became a reality through the name of the one who came to save us and set us free. And what I want you to take away from this is God started in the first chapter and said, y'all can only handle this much of me. Oh, we're going to have a relationship. Let me show you a little more of me. Oh, the patriarchs are coming along. Let me give you a little more of me. And then the new covenant comes and he says, I'm about to blow your mind. I'm going to show you something you ain't never seen before. Daddy. And then Daddy comes in the flesh and reveals to us in the final state all grace, all truth, and salvation by the one man, Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.